So I want to talk about a range of research methods that social scientists undertake. There are a number of approaches that we have in order to understand the social world. Often a distinction is made between quantitative research, which is based on numbers, focusing often on amounts or quantities of things, and qualitative research, which is frequently non-numerical and focuses on a range of themes and connections of the lived experience of people. I'm not going to, in this lecture, make a huge distinction between quantitative and qualitative research because I think that quantitative research can actually be rich, richly descriptive of people's experiences and qualitative research can allow us to understand quantities of things in the ways that quantitative research does too. A theme across the discussion of these different methods is going to be that there is no perfect method. So there's no ideal way to do research. Instead, each method has a range of benefits and a set, set of things that it's not as good at doing. And that as researchers, what we should do is be rather open to different methods and to think about balancing them as a community of researchers. So um, as social scientists and as researchers, our orientation should be towards the collective or the community and our shared knowledge, not our own particular knowledge. Um, in other words, the approach to method that we take in this modern contemporary era is one that is based in a collectivist orientation. I said in my first lecture on method, nobody owns science. And it's important to remember that, that science is a community exercise. It's something that we collectively participate in and evaluate. And so as a researcher, one of the things that you do is, is seek to deploy a method that helps advance an understanding relative to what your method is best at and draw upon other methods for insights given the things that your method is not as good at. So we're going to see benefits to each methods and limitations to each methods. And instead of thinking about this as the problem of the method and what we should be doing is searching for a perfect method, a different way to look at this is if we have a community of inquiry, a community that is collectively dedicated to rigorous inquiry, then what we want is a kind of number of methods that are de being deployed that each have their strengths and weaknesses, but where their strengths and weaknesses sort of align a little bit so that the weakness of one method is the strength of another. And then as a community of researchers, we can come together and know things, you know, more rich um, and, 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 and dare I say, like even scientific way, because while every single method has limitations, other methods help moderate those limitations, or they help make up for the fact that that method has a limitation. And as a community of scholars, together, we can come to understand the world in a better way. So while the orientation of a scientist is skepticism, to constantly be skeptical, the other orientation of a scientist is collectivist, or to think about oneself as a skeptical member of a shared community. The first method that I wanna talk about are experiments. And experiments are, uh, uh, in the last lecture, I outlined Diva Pager's experiments. Um, uh, experiments exist in many different forms. Some of them, like audit studies, uh, seek to do experiments in a quote unquote real world scenario or to have experiments that happen outside of the context of a lab. Other experiments seek to happen in the context of a lab where the experiment might happen in a room that the researcher controls. 
These different kinds of experiments aren't better or worse. They simply seek to focus on um, uh, different ways in which we might do an inquiry in order to establish what it is that they want to establish. Experiments, primarily, their orientation is to control the environment to isolate the effects of a single item. Another way of thinking about this is that experiments are the best method that we have to establish causality. Now, causality is something that's actually really hard to establish. It's um, nearly impossible to fully establish causality. Um, and there are lots of ways in which we try to establish causality. And in a subsequent lecture, I'm gonna talk a little bit about those ways. I'm gonna talk about how it is um, that sometimes we use time to establish causality. Because if something happens before something else, this thing that happens before can't be the effect. It has to be the cause, if it's a cause at all. But what experiments seek to do is isolate the effect of a particular variable, or what I call here, one item. And if um, we see effects of that one item, and that one item is the only thing that's changed, then we can assign a causal impact to that one item. Now, this is a little abstract, so let me try and be um, uh, clearer. The social world is really messy. Lots of things impact lots of other things, and they all happen simultaneously. And so it's super hard to look at what we might refer to as the independent effect of an item of the world. So what is the effect of gender on your earnings? What seems like a very simple question is incre incredibly difficult to figure out. Why? Well, because there are lots of other things that are different between people other than their gender, and that those things are related to their gender. So women are disproportionately likely to be engaged in child rearing um, and to spend significantly more time raising children. This means that women are likely to be outside of the labor force for some period of time. That is, they are not likely to be working um, at least you know, towards the very end of their pregnancy and then maybe in the early um, periods of first having a child. Not all women, but certainly many of them. We know that being out of the labor force, that is not working for a period of time, has an effect on your wages. You make a little bit less if you spend time out of the labor force. So some of the effect that we think of as being associated with gender and wages could be explained by women's time out of the labor force, which is related, of course, to the fact that they're women but the main cause there of that part of the effect would be time out of the labor force, not gender. So here we begin to see just a tiny example of how it is that things might be quite messy. Similarly, women and men may pick different kinds of jobs. And insofar as they pick different kinds of jobs, the types of jobs that they pick may have different wages associated with them. Now, is that a causal effect of gender? It's hard to say. Let me be clear, in my evaluation of the research, there are clear gendered effects on earnings. In other words, we can assign causal impact to gender on earnings or what I would identify as discrimination. But it's very hard to be able to do that. And one of the tools that allows us to better evaluate the causal effect of any one factor are experiments. And the way in which they do this is to control all factors, seen and unseen. So they control everything else in the world except the one factor that they're testing. So how does this logic work? Well, in order for two things to be related to one another, we need to see what's referred to as co-variation. They both have to change. So one thing has to change and another thing has to change. And that tells us about an association. 
So you could have two different categories of gender, that's variation relative to gender, and then different values of wages. If you do not observe co-variation, changes between your two factors, then you do not have an association. So this is a very kind of simple insight that I'm gonna hit on again and again and again in these methods lectures. But in order to establish something, what you need to see is two factors changing together. And they can change in all kinds of ways. One can go up and the other can go down. One can go down and the other can go up. They can go, go up together, they could go, go down together. There are lots of ways in which things could change together. So what changes? Well, currently, your level of education is changing. And there's an assumption about what that's doing in the world. Your level of education is going up, and there's an assumption that your earnings will go up. So as one thing changes, the other thing also changes. So this co-variation is essential to generating an explanation. Now, what is it that experiments do? Well, primarily, the thing that they do is allow only one thing to change. So a well-designed experiment, only one factor changes. That thing that the experimentalist is trying to study. And then any other observations that they make of change will be causally identified with that change. So in other words, if only one thing changes and you manipulate its change, it is the only thing that could potentially explain the effect that you observe in the world. And this is the huge advantage of experiments. Experiments, as I said earlier, are great at establishing causality. So um, uh, 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 when do we do experiments? Well, you know, really, we do experiments uh, in instances where we know a lot about what's happening. We have a good sense of the association between different factors. But we're not really sure which ones are causally explanatory. So experiments, from my perspective, and this is just kind of my unique perspective, maybe. I don't think it's that unique are really effective when we already know a lot about the world. We kind of know what factors are likely to matter as an explanation. And so we want to causally identify and evaluate whether or not they are explanatory of those factors rather than just associated with them. Now, there are multiple weaknesses to um, experiments. One of them is that we can't ethically study some topics experimentally. It's difficult from a research ethics perspective. Why? Well, the critical dimension of experiments is random assignment of our uh, independent variable. And I'll explain in a little bit what an independent variable is, but a random assignment of the thing that's meant to change. But some things, it's difficult to sort of isolate for a long period of time the effect of that thing or to even change it. So, so for example, you know, um, if I want to be able to study, you know, the effect of race on employment, I can't actually randomly assign people to race. Like they, act, they already have an existing race. And I also can't intentionally isolate people from all other factors that could be explanatory. In this way, experiments are seen to have high degrees of internal validity and low degrees of external validity. Or put in a simpler way, experiments have a really great logical design. But whether or not the findings of an experiment extend beyond the context of the research is usually in question. So experiments are gonna be great at establishing causality, but we might ask ourselves, is that establishment of causality applicable to situations outside of the research context? So imagine for a moment that I put you in a lab and I control the situation to such a high degree that only one thing changes. 
So let's say I'm interested in the effect of stress on performance. So I put you guys in a lab, you know, I put you, you in a particular lab, and then I either subject you to stress or I don't subject you to stress. So for those of you who have been subject to stress or not subject to stress, I then give you a little exam. It's a basic exam, maybe it's a simple math exam. And I wanna see what is the impact of having been exposed to that stress on how well you perform on that exam. And what I find, I'm, I'm gonna opine that what I'll find is that stress has a negative impact on your exam performance. So I don't know if that's true, but I'm just gonna suggest that it is. Well, you know, one of the things you might ask is like, is that lab experiment representative of the many ways in which people experience stress? Now, for some students, it certainly would be because often you find yourself in a room taking a math test. But in many other instances, it's not applicable at all because you're not isolated in a room with everything controlled except for the experience of stress. We all live these rich, multi-textured lives. So the major strength of an experiment is for our capacity to establish causality but a major weakness is how far we can extend the insights of that experiment, how valid the findings are outside the context of the experiment itself. So this will be, this, the, uh, this can then be moderated by other kinds of methods. So surveys um, are an extremely common form of research and these exist both as social science research um, and also in market and, and other kinds of corporate research. And so many of you have likely encountered surveys all the time because we get sent surveys via email from companies we buy things from and maybe even from researchers. So whenever you're asked to rate your satisfaction with customer service through a call or through some internet um, uh, inquiry, that is a survey. The strengths of surveys is that they're relatively quick and cheap. It's pretty hard to run an experiment. You need to get people involved. You need to organize them. The people that you select are usually not randomly selected, but they're conveniently selected, which limits your capacity to talk about the impact of that. So surveys, by contrast, you can do incredibly quickly and you can do them cheaply. I mean, you know, for a survey, like um, if I were to do an experiment on you guys, those of you who are listening right now, in all likelihood, I would have to do an experiment on you one by one by one by one. So let's say there's hundreds of people who listen to this. It would take me hundreds of hours to do um, uh, the experiment. A survey, by contrast, you could all do simultaneously. You could all do it at the same time. It might just take an hour for all of you to do it so that the survey could, of 100 people could be done in one hour, whereas an experiment might take 100 hours for 100. Another thing is that there are many ways in which surveys could be done. We could do them online. So you could take an online survey. I, I would suspect that most of you have taken some kind of online survey in your lives. You can take it over the phone. Someone might call you and ask a series of questions. It can be done in person. I could send a researcher somewhere. And often, if we're trying to do surveys of populations that don't have um, as much infrastructure, say a very rural village, for example, I might send people in, in person. That then becomes time consuming and expensive, but still it's a way in which we can do them. Or you can fill out a physical survey. It's, it's you know, we can get mailed one. In the United States, just recently um, in 2020, there's a census that's happening. And that census is a physical thing that you fill out. Actually, many of us now are, are doing it online as well, um, uh, but it's a form that you, fill, that you can fill out. Now, a huge strength of this then is that we can get lots of information from lots of different kinds of people. And this makes surveys really, really powerful because unlike um, an experiment where we get information about typically only one factor, the one thing that we think is the cause about a fairly small group of people, with surveys, we might be able to ask dozens of questions from many, many types of people. So in this sense, surveys give us a kind of wide swath of understanding. 
where experiments are a really, really narrow focus on one thing, one particular factor, surveys are very expansive, bringing in many different people typically to ask them many different kinds of questions. I think of this as, you know, where experiments are really about attempting to establish causality, surveys are often very descriptive. Um, they're not necessarily descriptive, but they give us a rich sense of how many different people experience many different factors in their lives. Now, the weaknesses of surveys is that they could be hard to get people to respond, and the people who don't respond may not respond for a particular reason, so we'll call this non-response bias, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But also um, uh, that as surveys have proliferated, where you almost can't buy anything today without getting a subsequent email saying, how was your shopping experience? Or, you know, how was the experience of talking to that person on the phone who was meant to, to provide you with customer service? That there's a certain degree of fatigue among people, and people are increasingly concerned also with their privacy. And so there's an increased reluctance to fill out surveys. Technology is also affecting surveys, um, you know, where uh, uh, this can make, in some ways, it much easier for you to ask people things because many people have access to um, uh, get access to a large number of people. Um, uh, but, you know, one of the challenges will be how it is that people experience or understand your survey. So in the next lecture, I'm going to talk about how it is that different words can mean different things to different people. And this creates real challenges for surveyors. So um, you, you might think about what it would mean to ask people, do you identify as gay or lesbian versus do you identify as homosexual? In English, those words actually have kind of different meanings and they have different subjective meanings to people. And that could lead to different responses from participants. And so we, you know, encounter within surveys all kinds of challenges um, uh, relative to this way in which question asking um, um, can generate all kinds of like um, uh, things that we struggle over constantly in terms of how is it that we articulate the concepts that we're interested in. In the next lecture, I'll talk to you extensively about this, and in particular, the question of how it is that we operationalize a concept. Participant observation is something where the researcher goes and directly observes the social world that they're studying. So where surveys um, allow, allow people to tell us what their experiences are, participant observation is about directly observing and participant observation can give us extremely in-depth knowledge of how people interact, how they view the world, and how they make sense of their place in society. The strength here is that you get very detailed information about how people act in a certain context, how it is that in the context that you're observing, they act and interact with people. This often ends up being enormously descriptive. So whereas uh, experiments are about narrowing your focus onto one variable, one particular thing that you want to look at, participant observation is sort of looking not at that singular narrowness, but the kind of dense messiness of life. And um, uh, what happens is that the researcher generates often a personal understanding of what it feels like to take part in and be part of a social world. So a participant in everyday social life. An example of this would be if I wanted to know what it was like to live in a particular kind of neighborhood. And so I went and I like moved to that neighborhood and I got a sense of what it felt like to walk through the neighborhood, where it was safe and where it wasn't safe, how people interacted on the street or if they didn't, what the rhythm of that neighborhood was. Here, I'm often not interested in isolating the effect of a particular variable. Instead, I'm trying to give a rich, descriptive sense of what social life is like. Now, this provides us then often with the capacity to say, actually, there are these variables or these factors that we haven't considered that are really important for understanding 
people's experience and the ways in which we traverse the social world. But there are many weaknesses to such participant observation. It's enormously time consuming. There are very few economies of scale. It requires a person, and this is actually the type of research I often do, to go somewhere and spend huge amounts of time there. The other is that like where surveys have this huge advantage of being able to give you information about lots and lots of people, participant observation only gives you information about a few people, like a couple people. You have like a tiny group of people. It might, you might just study 20 people. And so where surveys prioritize understanding a few variables with lots of different people, Participant observation typically prioritizes understanding huge numbers of variables for very few people. And so these things can balance each other out a little bit. You know, a survey might be able to ask you 100 questions and so kind of look maybe at 50 factors and how they relate to one another. With participant observation, you might be categorizing and, and people relative to thousands of different variables many, many different ways in which people are experiencing their world, but it's gonna be a really small group of people and you may not be able to extend your insights beyond the context that you're studying. Finally, historical and content analysis um, uh, is a way in which we use different kinds of administrative and official records, or maybe sometimes unofficial records, historical records, newspapers, TV shows, transcripts of testimony in courts or in politics in order to understand things that have happened in the past or even sometimes things that are happening in the present. Um, and so, you know, this method, this, this, this approach, allows you to look for patterns or themes that might not be evident otherwise. Um, and it allows us to see how topics or things are framed to groups of people. So how is it that the media talks about a particular event? We could do a content analysis of newspapers around the world and ask, how is it that those newspapers talk about the experience of COVID? And in all likelihood, in the United States and in Norway and in China and in Kenya, there would be different ways in which countries talked about this experience this would mean doing a, looking at the content of those papers. The study um, uh, uh, will be subject to um, a series of challenges as it does this. Um, and, and one of them will be that, particularly in uh, historical analysis, the only thing that you can study are records that already exist. And one of the things that we know often about um, records that already exist, is that they're intimately tied to power. So what are the records of history? Um, often the accounts of people who won that history. And what do nations do? Often they seek to hide certain elements of their history from others. And this means that we have to think about the question of selection when looking at something like historical factors. And by selection, what I mean is, what is it? as information that survived. So sometimes our historical accounts are not accounts of what happened, they're accounts of the information that survived, the information that continues to exist. And that that information is intimately tied to the power of different groups of people in the world. Now, these approaches really also can't control for the quality of data. So one of the things that we do in experiments, in surveys, and in participant observation, which also includes some interviews, is to focus a lot on data quality. But for historical and content analysis, the data already exist. We are in some ways simply finding in an archive or some kind of place existing data that may be highly selective. So I want to give one brief example of this. You know, if you want to know what happened during a revolution, what you're going to find out will be highly contingent on who won in the revolution. If one group wins, what are they going to do? Well, they may destroy information about bad things they did in the revolutionary process. And so if years later you study that revolution, what are you going to find? Very little things about the bad things that the winners did and probably lots of things about the bad things that the losers did. 
in this sense, the data quality is often in question. Now, this is something that researchers know. They're not ignorant of this. And what they seek to do is try and gather information from many different kinds of sources in order to moderate that problem of selection. And the problem of selection doesn't just exist for historical and content analysis. It exists for all kinds of research. That is, what gets selected into an observation? When survey researchers do surveys, some people choose not to participate in the survey. And when they choose not to participate in the survey, when they select out of participation, there are things that we don't learn. For participant observation, if you're living in a community, some people may avoid you. They may say, I want nothing to do with that researcher. There are then people who are selecting out of research. And if those people, you know, they're given the right of informed consent, they know that they don't have to participate if they don't want to, if the research is ethically done in that way, then again, people are selected out of research. So historical um, uh, selection is a problem. It's not really a unique problem, um, but it's one that we need to be deeply sensitive to. So to conclude, you know, most topics can be studied with a variety of methods. And it's really rare that there's only one method or clear preferred method for studying a topic. Instead, the researcher's interests, intents, and resources will usually determine the type of method that they deploy. This means time and money required to, un to undertake some kind of method and whether or not it's realistic. If I, for example, wanted to go do research in China, I would have a huge set of problems with doing that research. Um, one, because of language. I mean, I, I only speak, well, I speak a few languages, but in, in, I don't speak um, Mandarin or Cantonese, so I would have a huge problem conversing with people. It would take me a lot of time to get there. Um, and so there's a huge set of resources that would kind of determine the method I undertook in order to study life in China. And those would be practical considerations of the researcher. You know, um, also, I um, tend to go to bed pretty early. I, I go to bed early and I wake up early. And so, you know, it would be really hard for me to be a participant observer of nightlife, of raves that happen from two to four in the morning, be deeply impractical. So some of this is really about like what it is that researchers can do. You know, if I wanted to do a survey of the US population, it would cost me millions of dollars. And so I would need millions of dollars to do that research. And if I didn't get a grant to do it, I wouldn't be able to do it. So some of these are really practical considerations and it's fine that researchers do that as long as their orientation is one of critical skepticism. What researchers do is they seek to provide information to a community based upon the method that they selected often for deeply practical reasons and that then all of the people who are part of that research community draw upon those insights. Every kind of research has some benefit and some limitation. And so there is no best method. Each research method is a compromise based on what the research, researcher wants to study and the available resources, research skills, and other factors that make a study possible. So, here I'm gonna stop and in the next lecture, I'm gonna talk about what it means to begin to actually design your own study.